Primarily, I want to be dealing with just one verse this afternoon. And we shall simply be noticing a brief study of Psalm 119 and verse 160. Notice that I have there that we're studying it from the standpoint of it relating to ascertaining Bible authority. Now, some people may say we just say too much about you must have Bible authority for everything you believe in practice, but what we have painted up here by Buddy reminding us that would be a good thing to put in that blank space and then going about getting it done is Colossians 3.17. Now, there are other passages that would teach the same thing, but I suggest to you and about any other church, even some churches of Christ, you would not see that passage, Colossians 3.17, emphasized. We spend a lot of time on it here because it just simply comes down to this. We talked this morning about the care of our soul. It's the greatest, of which there's no greater, value that we have. That is how valuable our soul is. But if we do not know how to ascertain the authority of our Savior, the head of the church, he who purchased the church with his blood, who adds every person saved by their obedience to the gospel to his church, then we don't care much about our soul. Because it's by submission to the will of Jesus Christ that we're saved. I would hate to take the position that You don't have to submit to the will of Jesus Christ. And in so rejecting it, you can go to heaven. I don't believe that. I don't think anybody in this room would actually articulate that at all. And most people in any church that says Jesus is a Savior would never say, you can just say, no, I won't obey Him and He'll save me just as well. So we're interested in this, and specifically this particular verse. Consider with me then that Psalm 119, verse 160, in the King James Version. The passage reads, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Ah, That's true. No doubt about it. Thy word is true. Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. We can, with Psalm 119, verse 172, understand, as we have many times, that all of God's commandments are righteousness. So every time, or when we read, every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever, then that would mean everything the Bible teaches endures forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my word will not pass away. But that's the King James Version. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Now look with me to Psalm 119 and verse 160. This is the American Standard Version, 1901. I say that because there's a newer American Standard Version. That's not the one I'm referring to. This one, I think, as far as translating the Hebrew into English, says it better and gets to the point I want to make more than does the King James Version of this same verse. The text states, The sum of thy word is truth, and every one of thy righteous ordinances endureth forever. You'll notice the second part of the verse is pretty much the same as the King James Version in the second part of the verse. But it's the first part we're interested in. The sum, and emphasize that word sum, the sum of thy word is truth. Now we'll talk about that just a little more, but I would like to then move to uh, the next version that we use. And you'll notice these versions are all versions that we recognize to be good translations of the Scriptures without Problems that are very significant, as some other versions are. And this is the new King James Version. And it it reads, 
and this is the point I'm interested in, in Psalm 119, verse 160. The New King James reads, The entirety, in the place of some, from the American Standard, the entirety of your word is truth. There's not a thing in the world wrong with that either. But again, I want to emphasize something that is in the American Standard regarding the sum. The word sum, of course it renders in the English a Hebrew word. Now the transliterated Hebrew word is a four-letter word, rosh. The transliteration is R-O-S-H. Rosh. And it's uh, on numerous occasions in the Bible per- used to pertain to the sum. Now I introduce a new, introduce a new word. Or total elements of a people. Now it can be used in other ways depending upon the context. And the only thing I can tell you about where words change depending upon the environment of the word or the context of the word, you have to study it to know that. But this is the word, rosh, that is translated some in the American Standard 1901, Psalm 119, verse 60, or 160. Let me show you how it's used regarding people because... I pointed out that that word rosh is used many times as it pertains to the sum or the total elements of a people. Example would be referring to Israel itself. It denotes the sum or totality of the congregation of Israel. In such verses as Exodus 30 and verse 12, and this is, used that way in the American Standard Version in these passages, Exodus 30, 12, Numbers 1, verse 2, and Numbers 26 and verse 2. So that same word in the American Standard Version, 1901, is rendered S-U-M, sum. So since the congregation was made up of individuals, but mark that, even as this congregation is, each individual being a part of the whole or the sum or the total number of the congregation. So it's it's learning to see in the case of a congregation, and we'll just bring it over to this congregation of God's people here at Spring, the church just doesn't consist in, in a conglomerate, in a cooperative type standing. It exists with each individual, saved by their individual response to the gospel, and saved by their individual faithful living. And all of them working together according to their several abilities, then make the whole, the sum, function. And you can see that when Paul talks to the church at Corinth, and he talks about the church as a body. And he talks about the different members of the body. And now one member can't say to another member, you don't amount to much. And we often illustrate that by saying, well, have you ever hit your little finger with a hammer to the point to where, you know, uh, maybe makes the fingernail come off. Your whole body says all that amounts to anything now is your little finger. And you know about it and you're not interested in your nose or your ear or your foot. You're interested in only... That little finger in the hole and all its parts tell you that. Well, we sometimes sing a song when sorrow passes from eye to eye, meaning that the spiritual body of Christ and each member that makes it up, each one of us are mindful of the needs of others. And when others rejoice, and the Bible even tells us that we should uh, rejoice with one another. And that we should be concerned about the needs of each individual that makes up the one single solitary body. Now the next point I want to make is found in the, um, let's see, the psalmist in affirming what is said here. Yes, that's it. What the psalmist is affirming in this, and notice I say affirm. We usually use that terminology when it has to do with a debate. And we're thinking about a proposition. 
we might say that a propositional statement is a sentence. But what sets a statement apart from other sentences, since it is a sentence? Well, what makes a statement a statement and separates it from all other sentences is that it makes a claim. It makes a claim that something is thus and so. So the psalmist is affirming that God's Word's true. We have no problem with that, do we? At least I don't think anybody in this room would. But then, notice, it's true in all of its individual parts. Now, if I say the church at spring is faithful to the Lord, to honestly be able to say that, what do I have to say about all the individual members? Each one of the members is faithful to the Lord. Coming over to the Bible, as to any Bible authority, or rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, the psalmist then is saying, when you put it all together, that is the Scriptures, and what it's teaching on any one topic, and then you have the whole truth. You have the whole truth. So this confirms what our Lord said of the inspired word when He says it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. But now notice, by some words, S-O-M-E, or every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Matthew 4.4. 4. And what the inspired writer Paul told Timothy in the beginning of 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So all the words from heaven to man in both the Old and New Testament came from where? It came from God, or they came from God. All right, we're going to, to study uh, baptism. And we're going to study baptism as God has revealed it in the Bible. That means if I want to know all God said about baptism... I have to say, or do as we often say, I have to take the sum total of what the Bible says about baptism. Let's move it over to the matter of, has God through Christ legislated and revealed in His Word, His law, the kind of music that Christians are to employ when they worship God in music? Well, look at Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do, in word, deed, do all in the name by His authority. Okay, so He has, hasn't He? If we know anything about what God wants as to the kind of music He would be worshipped with, we're going to find it where? We've got to find it in the Bible. That involves us understanding the difference in the Old and New Testament. It involves us understanding the patriarchal system and how it's come along and what it did and what it was for and the fact that it's ended. The same is true when it comes to the law of Moses, what was authorized there for the Jews and what it was for as a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3.24, and its period of time and how it's no longer the way men approach God. But now we approach God through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only and His will. Again, Colossians 3.17. So I'm concerned about the authority of Christ. Why His authority? He's king. He's absolute monarch. His word is law. So we're concerned about when we study any portion of the God-inspired Scripture, we must, it's obligatory, you can't get around it. We must include the sum or totality of the Scriptures in order to come to a logical, harmonious, and trustworthy conclusion as to the correct meaning of the text under study. So, what am I going to do about the will of Christ manifested in the words of Christ in the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, relative to worshiping God and as our illustration is, in music. I'm going to take everything in the New Testament he said about it. And I'm going to get the sum total of the truth of everything he said about it before I conclude 
what God expects me to conclude, to determine about that music. Now, we're not doing this now, but you take every verse there is in the New Testament. Every word there is in the New Testament of Jesus Christ about the worship of God and what worship is, and then specifically in the worship of God when it comes to music, and you'll see it's singing. Period. We could go back to baptism. You take everything the New Testament teaches about baptism, and you will see we're under the baptism of the Great Commission. The one baptism of Ephesians 4. Make a difference how many baptisms there were before AD 62 in the writing of the book of, of Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, the Holy Spirit through Paul said there's one. Now, which one is it? It's the one to be preached to the end of the world. Thus, it's Great Commission baptism. Well, what's peculiar about Great Commission baptism? It's a burial in water. So how do I know the mode of the baptism that God commands us to uh, obey is a burial in water? Because I can take the sum of the teaching of the New Testament on baptism, the totality of it, and come to the conclusion. It's that simple. Now, you say, that takes a lot of time. Yes, that's exactly right. Now stop for a minute and think. When you know, call to mind all you know about what God's done for us that we never could have done for ourselves to save our souls from sin, when you consider the aspect of the time involved in what Jesus did to save David Brown's soul and yours, that was over 33 years. Short of our lifespan, but... Everything he did in those 33 or so years was time well spent, as far as I'm concerned. Because it ended up providing salvation for me when there wasn't any other way I was going to get it. So when it comes to studying his last will and testament, whose last will and testament? That one who spent all that time to do what was necessary to save me that I couldn't do for myself then shouldn't there be a certain amount of time spent on my part in studying? But here's the interesting thing about it. We look at all of that and we say, oh, that's a lot of time. But if you use so much of every day, guess by how much time you've engaged in Bible study when it's done properly over five years. I suggest to you that if you get in a place conducive to good Bible study where you can think, meditate on what you're reading, that if you studied 20 minutes a day, and I use the word study in its true meaning, being studious. In fact, if you just studied one Greek word that uh, somewhere appears in the New Testament, if you just did it that way, a word study, and you did it for 20 minutes, just that one word, do you realize what you would know about the Bible in five years? And what we tend to do is to hit or miss. We don't study it all for a couple of days. We might sit down then and read for 30 minutes. Or we might read for an hour. But then we may not read it all for the next few days. Or we might read 15 minutes the next day. And we might read it in the morning and we read it at night or whatever. The key is decently and in order. And that applies to you individually in the study of the Bible as much as it does to the church collectively in whatever we do. So when you come back and look at this brief study of Psalm 119, 160, as it relates to ascertaining Bible authority, then the sum of thy word is truth. But it takes some time to run those references and to see how those words fit into the literary environment, the context. It just simply takes time to do it. And any study falling short of this criteria will result in a faulty conclusion. God expects us to use our time on this earth to learn how to go to heaven. You know, you can almost see God saying, is that asking too much? Is it asking too much in view of the love I poured out on the whole world that rejected me, though they once knew me, they left me and did not want to retain me in my knowledge, but I wouldn't let them go? 
the second person of the Godhead, became my only begotten Son, and became a man just like they are, and showed them how God would live if He was a man. Because He became a man. And Peter said regarding suffering, but it covers everything regarding Christ, that He's left us an example that we should follow in His steps. Well, what about our Lord's own study? Our, our Lord's own concern with the will of His Father being done in His life. As a Jew, as he grew up, he spent time studying the Scriptures. It's true that our Lord certainly in view of the fact he had the ability to look at somebody and know whatever it was about them. I understand, because that means that spirit in him is God that never began or never was. But the fleshly humanity functions just like we do. And so he would have done everything a faithful Jewish family did. He would have been a part of all of it regarding the study of the Scriptures and so forth. Thus... In the temple, when he was about 12 years old, he asked his parents who were looking for him and desperate. He said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? Well, that involved time, didn't it? That involved time and used properly. So I, I simply draw this to a conclusion by saying, The sum of thy word is truth, and every one of thy righteous ordinances endureth forever. Thus, when you study the Scriptures... Whatever topic it is that you're studying, then take the time necessary every day to study that topic out before you decide, well, this is what it means. Just like you would determining the kind of music that God wants to be worshipped with. Take the time to study it out and find what the Lord in His last will and testament said about that music. I hope this has been helpful. I deliberately haven't made it very long. I would say something about even the brevity of it, and some folks are still struggling. But <laughs> the, the point I want to make <laughs> is that we didn't spend much time on this. But I hope it was helpful to see that in a brief period of time you can have some things help you understand better just by looking at one word in a verse and noticing how it's used in other versions that themselves are dependable and capable versions in our vernacular to understand what God gave them long ago in either Hebrew or Greek. It's a matter of our want to, brethren. That's what we have to train how much do we really want to know the Word of God? How much do we really want to know the will of God so it can be put into practice in our life? If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, what better time than now because it's all you have. Today's the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time to obey the gospel. There, there are some people here this afternoon who need to obey the gospel. You may be good people in a lot of ways, but you need to become Christian. You need to have your sins washed away so the Lord can add you to His church. You'd make a difference to other people in such a way if you would just be a Christian, and all that the Bible says that is. You probably already know that it's the Scriptures that create belief in Christ, and you must believe that He's the Son of God, John 8, 24, Hebrews 11, 1 and 6, Romans 10, 17. You must repent of your sins. Turn away from a life of practice sin. Turn to a life that I am determined to do what this book says, and I'm going to study it, and I'm going to glorify God in obedience to His will, and I'm going to be what Jesus said I'm supposed to be. That's repentance, Acts 17, 30. It's command to obey. Then to confess your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's your Savior. Romans 10, 10. You confess Him to be the Son of God. And then to finish your obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of your sins. If you need to obey the gospel, let, let me ask you, think seriously with me for a moment. Why would you want to put it off? You don't know what's going to happen. Did you hear that racket go down the road just then? You may pull out in front of him, leave him. And then what's going to happen? You don't ever know. 
Look at the news every day in Houston. Somebody's got messed up, shot, beat up, stomped on or something, and they started out just like you did, never expecting any of it. So be prepared. Best insurance in the world is to be a faithful Christian because all of us are going to die someday for something. So be prepared for when you die because you don't know when that's going to happen. Now that goes also for members of the church. Are you faithful? Are you studying like you ought to? Are you learning the Bible? If you need to repent of any sin, we urge you to do it. Confess it and pray God for forgiveness under God's second law of pardon. He'll hear and forgive. So if you need to obey the gospel, we beg you, we plead with you by the mercies of Christ to do so while we stand and while we sing.